Check, check, one, two, one, two, check, test, one, two. One, two, check, test, one, two, one, two, check. One, two, check, one, two, test, one, two.
Check one, two. Okay. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, once again, welcome to this event. We're excited to see you all here. We want to let you know that if you would like Spanish to English interpretation, English to Spanish interpretation, we do have audio phones available, and there will be interpretation uh, provided by the speakers. So to the right, when you walk into the auditorium, there'll be someone there to provide you with an audio phone. Only if you need Spanish. That's the only interpretation you have. <coughs> Thank you. 
All right, can everybody hear? Ooh, can everybody hear me? Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, we were going to start off with a prayer, but she's running a little bit late, so I'm just going to go ahead and do our welcome, and uh, we will pause uh, when the uh, when Janice gets here. So, um, oh, that's <laughs> I, I heard my voice. <laughs> um, <clears throat> <laughs> uh, welcome to the uh, International Women's Day 2019 event here uh, at the University of uh, Minnesota Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Uh, this year's focus is Indigenous women have always been leaders. My name is Jamie Davis. I'm from Turtle. I'm Ojibwe from Turtle Mountain and Hunkwapa Lakota from Standing Rock. Um, I reside here in Minneapolis and work in St. Paul as the program director for a Native-led nonprofit called the Native Governance Center. We at Native Governance Center are proud to co-host <laughs> this wonderful event, uh, along with the Tuahe Foundation and, of course, the University of Minnesota Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Um, at Native Governance Center, it is our mission to assist the 23 Native nations that we serve in strengthening their governance systems and capacity to exercise sovereignty. As you may know, today, <clears throat> Tribes are working to rebuild their governments in ways that work for their tribal citizens and align with their culture and history. At Native Governance Center, we work to assist tribes in these efforts to improve governance through two main areas, leadership development and tribal governance support. Our leadership program called the Native Nation Rebuilders Program is 177 rebuilders strong, and 61% of those rebuilders are Indigenous women. That's right. <laughs> Our tribal governance support program works with the 23 Native nations in the region. And within those nations, we have about 50 Indigenous women who have been elected to serve uh, their people on council. We are honored to do this work and proudly serve both um, elected tribal leaders, grassroots Native leaders, and Indigenous youth. It is in the spirit of this work, who I am and where I'm from, that today I would also like to open with a call to action. In the Guide to Land Acknowledgement provided by the United States uh, Department of Arts and Culture, it states that in countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and in some places, um, are, and, and among tribal nations in the United States, it is commonplace, and in some places even policy, to open events and gatherings by acknowledging the, the traditional indigenous inhabitants of that land. While some individuals and cultural and educational institutions in the United States have adopted this custom, many have not. Today, I hope to spark this movement here at the University of Minnesota. Today, we'd like to acknowledge that the land we are gathering on, it is the original homelands of the Dakota Oyate Nation. By acknowledging this, we understand the painful history of genocide and forced removal from their homelands. And we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people still connected to this land we inhabit and gather on today. We do this today as a necessary step toward honoring our indigenous communities and enacting a much larger project of decolonization and re reconciliation. As indigenous women, we are the backbone of our communities. We are trailblazers, decision makers, and mobilizers who make change happen. Today is about honoring all indigenous women, highlighting their passions and supporting their movements for a positive change. I'm honored to be in the presence of these amazing women and all of you leaders um, you'll hear from today. I hope today's events can help uh, open your mind to a greater consciousness of tribal sovereignty and cultural rights and the strength of indigenous women. Today is a great day to be an indigenous woman. Chi miigwech, wopilatanka, thank you. <laughs> now I'd like to bring up um, Dean Bloomberg.
Good morning and welcome. I'm Laura Bloomberg. I'm the Dean of the Humphrey School of Public Affairs and I just couldn't be more pleased and proud to be commemorating International Women's Day with all of you here in this space. There's so a couple of things I want to say. First, I'd like to, I believe we're live streaming right now, so I would also like to welcome people who are joining us virtually online who are not in this space. And because we are recognizing indigenous women from many parts of the world, not all of them English speaking, we will be translating comments today. And we have word that um, we need to slow down a little bit to make that go effectively. So I'm going to do my best to remember to do that. And I will urge our, our speakers for the rest of the day to do the same. Which also gives us a really nice opportunity to breathe every once in a while and just take a bit of a pause, which we don't do often in our day. I am the first female dean of the Humphrey School, and in a few months, thank you, and we, in a few, <laughs> like, and in a few months, we will welcome and and then uh, dedicate the presidency of the first female president of the University of Minnesota, and I couldn't be more proud of that. Yeah, it's a pretty exciting thing. And I want to take a moment uh, as a part of my welcome to situate what's happening here today, which I think is so powerful to Jamie's comments, in the place where we are. So if you'll, if you'll indulge me for a moment, I want to give you just a really short little history lesson. First of all, those of us who are here in person, not virtually, are sitting in what we call Cole's Auditorium. The full name is the John and Elizabeth Bates Coles Auditorium. Because history, uh, as, a, as a white woman, I am very aware of what I'm saying. History does not treat men and women equally. I am also painfully aware that history and the way it is told in many of our textbooks doesn't treat indigenous people equally either. But let me for a moment talk about women because history does not typically tell the story of men and women in the same way. Many of us who have lived in this community for a long time may know John Coles and his tremendous contributions uh, to the media in this community as, as um, a leader in the Star Tribune at the turn of the last century. But what you might not know is that Elizabeth Bates Coles founded Planned Parenthood in the state of Iowa. She was the first woman, Caucasian woman, to serve on the executive committee of the United Negro College Fund. And she was a tremendous investor in her own right in the arts and women in the arts in this community. So when we sit in this space, I'd like us to remember the strong women who, um, after the strong woman after whom this auditorium is named. And when you are in the commons outside of this space, we used to call it the atrium, we now call it the Joan and Walter Mondale Commons, Joan first, um, in this instance, there are a lot of things named after a former vice president and a renowned man and a highly regarded man in Walter Mondale. What fewer of us know, sadly, is the amazing diplomatic work that Joan Man Mondale did in her own right through her um, passion for the arts and arts as a tool of diplomacy. So when uh, Walter Mondale was appointed the ambassador to Japan and Joan and Walter Mondale went to Japan, it was at a very, very difficult, tense time. And people in Tokyo protested that these two Americans were going to be coming and living there. So Walter Mondale did all of his political stuff and Joan Mondale said about understanding the indigenous potting techniques of the Japanese people and said, show me where the leaders are, show me where the elders are who are potters and glazers and who capture their own history in that way. I wanna meet those people. And years later when they left um, Japan after a fairly successful stint there, the celebrations were first and foremost for Joan um, and the ways in which she used her diplomatic tools in her unique way to build alliances. So we commemorate Joan Mondale in the comments. We are situated in the Humphrey School, named after a man who in the 1940s very famously at the Democratic National Convention said it's time we stepped out of the dark shadows of states' rights into the bright sunshine of human rights. And that vision that Walter, that Hubert Humphrey had 
for the work that needs to be done in the world continues to animate this school today. And of course, this school is situated in the University of Minnesota that would not be here if we didn't recognize and, and honor the fact that it is situated on Dakota territory and Dakota homeland. That's the reality of where we are and our place. For a long time now, I've been thinking also about how the University of Minnesota is very close, just upstream from, and, and actually very, very close, if you think also about the St. Paul campus, to a place that my entire life I knew as Pike Island. Um, a beautiful place situated in the river. I like to ski down there. My husband and I bike down there in the summer. And it was only as an adult that I came to know, because my history books didn't tell me, of the story of Badote and this place in, in um, and I, I wanna do it justice and I am, I'm painfully aware that this is not my history to tell, but as I understand it, this very sacred place that tells the story of creation where the Mississippi and the Minnesota rivers come together and flow together, which is a beautiful thing. It's also the home of unspeakable sadness as a place of sanctuary after, um, horrific violence against Dakota people in this state. So I think about that. I think about this interesting um, tension between beauty and pain, between creation and violence, as I think about the relationship that this place, this University of Minnesota has with indigenous people. And all of those things impact how honored I am that we're holding this event with this topic here today. So I hope you'll hold that and think about that as we go through the day. Um, I also want to just recognize the people who really worked hard to make this happen. We have co-sponsors and sponsors that you have seen scrolling um, uh, on the screen. And so I won't identify all of them, but I would in particular like to recognize and thank our major sponsors, the Bush Foundation um, and the Young Women's Initiative of the Women's Foundation. If we could give them a round of applause. I'd really appreciate that. I am so proud of the Humphrey School Center on Women, Gender, and Public Policy um, with, and the, the leadership of Christina Ewig and Deborah Fitzpatrick. And their vision for this day was, was truly inspiring. And then the group of people that came together to organize and pull this off is terrific. So if you are a part of this amazing planning committee that I've heard so much about. I'm wondering if you could just stand so we could recognize you, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. So this, this, this title for today, and this is where I'm almost done talking at you. Um, Indigenous women have always been leaders. I love it. I love that's what we're calling this day. And I want to tell you these two very different reactions I've heard from people. I have heard from um, Native and non-Native people um, say to me, that's beautiful and that's empowering and, and that's an inspiring message and a good reminder. And then I had a conversation with a young Native woman from White Earth who I've known for quite a while through other work that I do. And she said, indigenous women have always been leaders. Well, yeah, <laughs> duh. <laughs> like, what else is new? And for both of those reasons, I'm really delighted that this is the name of the day, that it's honoring and inspiring and empowering, and it elucidates the obvious for a generation of young women who are like, that is what I know. Um, so I'm excited about that. I'm excited about what will happen today, and I am honored that you are all here at the Humphrey School. Thanks very much. Have a great day. Yes, timing is everything. Um, <laughs> so um, as Janice makes her way down, I'm going to introduce, say a few words about her, um, introduce her. Um, Janice is going to start us off in a good way with a prayer and song. Um, Janice is a tribal member of the Hunkpati Dakota Nation and has been employed with the Shakopee uh, Midewakan Sioux community for the past 26 years. 
as um, an assistant tribal administrator. Uh, she has or she transitions to um, a community cultural support program as well, and also is an indigenous consultant providing prayer openings and reflections of Dakota land um, acknowledgement of Minnesota Makoche land where the water waters reflect the skies. She is immersed in her Dakota traditions daily and provides healing work through various traditional uh, modalities. Janice will now open our event today with a prayer and song. I ask you to rise, to rise um, if it is your custom to do so. Hamitakiopi, ha Dakota Ia Chetaska, wa Chinwik Ata Shunka wa Pewe Makiapia, Crow Creek Hetchia Taha wa here, Chante Washtet na Petchi Yuza Pia. Good morning, relatives. I said I greet you with a good heart and handshake today. Um, I'm honored to be invited here to share prayer with you and to provide a spiritual grounding. So um, first thing as Dakota Protocol, we always say welcome to our visitors on Minnesota Makoche. So our ancestors would have said to you, Chante washte na pechi yuza piye, yahimpiki washte, welcome everyone with a good heart and a handshake today. So today I want to share a prayer with you. You know, um, in our Dakota traditions, our medicine ways, we, our body is the chanupa, a sacred pipe, that our spinal cord is the wood stem and our chante, our heart is the bowl. And when those two things, sacred objects come together, we're making ourselves as a human being relative and to all that is. And our opag, our chandi opagi is our mind, our free will and choice offerings. And we put that into our chanupa, into our heart. And it's up to us to make those relationships with our prayers. And so that would be a prayerful walk in our life way. So Wopira Tunka, I want to um, honor all the women here in this prayer mm -hmm. and song. So I thank you again for um, being patient as I was uh, driving over here really fast from Shakopee. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to come and slow down. So uh, thank you very much. We're going to pray however you pray, um, standing in your language, um, grounding yourself. Tukashira wakantaka unchimaka Tate topa wamakashka dakushkashka wo wakanki henani tawa tukashira wakantaka ho uwaye tukashira wakantaka mi dakuye obwanik de chechewakiaye wo dakuye dena dawashte nina pidamiaye creator we look to you mother earth we look to you. Directions in our life ways, we look to you. You are the one that beholds all the power and wisdom and knowledge. We ask you for the blessing today to come together in unity and the matriarchal voices of our ancestral women and grandmothers. And those that are still here, we give you thanks to Wakantaka. Nina Wopira Tunka, today I pray with my relatives. Iho, mi takuye, oyasi. And I'm going to share with you a song. It's a woman's song birthed out of a great need of prayer to, to rise further above. We cried for old medicine for our children and our sick people. At our Wiwangwachi at the Sundance, at the Chawaka, the tree. And this, and this holiness came to look at us, to see if we were truthful and real, and if it was, if it was to be. And this female Messiah spirit, her name is White Buffalo Calf Woman. 
So I wrote the prayer action and my, my nephew, Micah Nikki had composed it, the song for us. So we share the energy um, with our relatives. We ask permission from the spirits to put our minds and hearts together and that we, that the great need would birth out of this today. Mm -hmm. Te sa we ni wa ka cha ye lo hai ya he yo ni e ni shna la da ku wa ka he na he ya he ye lo ai ya he yo te sa we ma ya ni Choka wakaya hema yanik te lo haya heyo mayani mayani yelo haya heyo we are waka wope a yellow to thank you again for praying with me and sharing our good medicine today. So, Wopida uh, Tunka, have a beautiful day and, and use your power, your personal power as a woman and all that matriarchal anchor knowledge to come together to share and lift our spirits today. Teach these young women and honor our grandmothers and be good sisters today. Be your society your medicine society. Wopira tunka mitakuye oyasi. All right. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, ah, feel so much better already. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, we're going to transition now into the intergenerational leadership panel. So if you want to come up, that'd be great. My name is Brooke LaFlo. I was in English. I was named after the bend in the river. 
And I want to say thank you for being here today. And thank you to our intergenerational panel for being here today. Um, I come from the Eagle Clan and I am enrolled in the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, but I've grown up in these great cities for the most of my life. Um, and we want to just introduce our intergenerational panel. We thought it was really important to have this panel because despite our ages, young, old, elder, youth, our women have always been leaders, right? And despite having different roles in our communities and coming from different tribes, we have a lot of work that we contribute to our communities. And in our culture and in many of our traditions, we have this seven generation concept, right? Where we have a purpose to those who we are descendants from and to those that we also will become descendants of us. Um, so that's why we are having this panel um, and we hope you enjoy. I will let these women introduce themselves and then we'll get into some of our questions. That, that starts me. <laughs> yeah. um, Buju, I'm Alexis Davis. Um, I'm enrolled and I was born in Turtle Mountain Reservation, um, Belcourt, North Dakota. Um, my parents are Wes and Sarah Davis. <laughs> um, I am a sophomore at Turtle Mountain Community College. I am graduating with my Associate Arts and Science this fall. Yeah. Beautiful. Doesn't it feel so like awesome in here? It's like all cozy and like <laughs> we're all like empowering each other. It's great. I just feel so comfortable in here. I love it. Um, and you guys are all so beautiful, but um, I think that uh, I'm on, I'm the chairwoman of the Turtle Mountain Youth Council, and I am part of the Native Nations Youth Rebuilders, so that's why I got asked to be here today. Thank you to Jamie and Native Governments. I'm so honored. Um, but yeah, that includes my introduction. Thank you for listening and being here today. Jimmy Gwich. Hama Takiapi, Wachian Kapi, Kinwashe, Jaden Propes, Imakiapie, Damakota, Badeo Kantua, um, hello, everyone. It's good to see you all. My name is Jaden Probst. I am Dakota from Chashayapi, otherwise known as Lower Sioux. I'm 17 years old. I'm a senior at Redwood Valley High School, but a second year online PSEO student through the University of Minnesota. Um, <laughs> um, I serve on, or I'm the president of my school's Unity Council, which stands for United National Indian and Tribal Youth. I'm the president of my school's National Honor Society and a senior class officer. Um, Community-wise, I am a youth ambassador for the Lower Sioux Health and Human Services Advisory Committee. Uh, we work to put out healthy policies to better our community, such as a healthy foods initiative and a tobacco policy. Um, I also am on the Young Women's Cabinet, which is why Brooke asked me to be here. Um, I was just appointed in October, but prior to that, I was on the Minnesota Tribal Youth Gathering Steering Team, which uh, worked to put out the first Minnesota Tribal Youth Gathering this past summer, and it turned out really awesome. <laughs> um, as far as future plans, I will be attending the University of Minnesota Rochester for a Bachelor of Science in Health Sciences, and then hopefully move on to medical school for a degree in pediatrics. Wow. Yeah. Um, Hello, my name is Vanessa. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, I can't really follow Jaden. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Vanessa Gutthunder. My Dakota name is Nasnawi, which means jingling woman. I come from where they paint the trees red, so the lower Sioux, just like Jaden. It's about two and a half hours southwest Minnesota. The parking is free. <laughs> Honestly, um, I am Bedewa Kantua Dakota, and I'm also Twitchini um, Dene, so Navajo. Um, yeah, my mom's from Arizona. Hey, hey, hey! Oh, sorry. My mom's from Arizona. My dad's from Minnesota. That's a whole other story on itself how they met, but it created this. 
<laughs> and then um, I'm the director of Chanshayapiwakayanja Oyawa OT, which is a Dakota Immersion birth to five-year-old school. We just opened doors August 1st. They had a really shiny red ribbon. We got to cut it. It was legit. Um, <laughs> We have a staff about 36, and of those 36, 32 of them are women. Yay. Yay. And so we're just a group of, of people who uh, listen to the community, and, and we grew this school so that we can grow the next generation of Dakota language speakers. So I'm just so proud to, to be working there with them and um, growing with and for the community. And so I think that's why I got invited. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the cable to it. Uh Buju and Indwe Magani Dug Nagamo Mayangan and Dishnakaz, Wabishesh and Dota, Mochiboy Koyan down, Tishni Jo Madeo, Made Wanakwe, uh uh Jagana Sharon Day and Dishnakaz. Um, so I, I just want to uh, say, you know, it's really um, wonderful to be here with, with everyone and these young people. And I won't tell you what I was doing when I was 17. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the executive director of the Indigenous Peoples Task Force and um, was the uh, founding um, director and um you know, we've done many things over the years, and um, uh, we have a um, variety of programs. And I I guess I was invited because it said intergenerational, and they needed an old person. <laughs> no. me, and, me and Vanessa are middle age, OK? <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> Thank you all for introducing yourself. Um, so we're going to, today we're going to do our questions up here, and then we are going to open up the last 10 minutes to the audience questions as well. So feel free to type them in or um, write them if you have them. So the first two questions I have is for Jaden and Alexis. And I want to ask you guys, who are the mentors in your life? And what are your mentorship stories? Okay, mine's going to sound like really, really corny. But um, my parents are like my biggest mentors. Honestly, they're like my best friends. And I love them so much. Um, they've inspired me and they've led me to be the person I am today. And I, I can proudly say I'm confident and I'm happy with who I am. And it's important to acknowledge that. And um, my my dad, for example, my dad, like, I can go to him for, like, I'll be like, Dad, do these shoes, like, go good with my outfit? And he'll be like, <laughs> yes, like, they look great. And then he'll just walk away. But then, of course, I'll get into the, these problems, these life problems, where I just, I don't know what to do, and I need the answers, and I ask my dad. And somehow he, like, gives me the answer, and he gives me that that passage, and he just makes me feel good about what I'm doing and how I'm going forth with things. And he's done, he's done amazing things. And he's like, when he talks, like he is so inspirational, but you have to, you have to ask him about like geothermal energy and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm not really into that, but if you get him in a room and you ask him about that, he could go on for hours and hours and hours. And um, he, he gave that to me. And that's so, I love him for that. And of course my mom, my mom does, um, she does women's impact in like self-defense. So she teaches women how to self-defend, like defend themselves in, in sticky situations. And she teaches them um, how to say no and how to set your boundaries. And when it does come to violence, uh, how to protect yourself. So, um, and she is so passionate about that. She's passionate about our women, our people, how to protect them, how to learn how to protect yourself. And of course she is just as passionate. Um, They've they really said that to me and they've taught me that um, they put themselves out there. So I learned from their life stories, from their mistakes. And I do that now. I feel like I do that now. I'm not afraid um, to acknowledge that I've made mistakes and to present those so people learn from 
my pain and my hurt and the stuff I went through. And that's just something I'm grateful for. So yeah, those are my, my inspirers, my mentors. Of course I have, um, those are my big people, but of course there's people like there's Jamie Davis, there's Missy. These girls are bosses. Like I just love them. They inspire me. I mean, they made me think critically and they made me think of how I want to go forth professionally and how to express myself. And uh, they're always there, like cheering me on, like they're my aunties or something. <laughs> it's beautiful. I love them. And th those are my mentors that I love each and every one of them. Thank you. Um, so professional wise, I would say I have two main mentors. Um, this past summer, I was lucky enough to get a step up internship, which is like an eight week research program. And then it culminates with the trip to DC where we present our research at the National Institutes of Health. Um, since it was a national program, I was placed under a national mentor who was Dr. Carolee Dodge Francis, who was at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, so she was like my, my contact for whenever I had anything going on. And then I finally got to meet her when I went to DC, which is really nice because she was just like a person behind the screen up until that point. Um, so, and then close to home, I got to conduct my research at the Lower Sioux Healthcare Center. So I got mentored under the clinic CEO, Dr. Darren Prescott, and he was the one to like be there day to day with my research and questions and stuff. And it was kind of full circle because Dr. Carly Dodge Francis was his mentor when he was in college. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then personal wise, um, my mom, she's sitting over there. Um, <laughs> she, I don't know how she does it, but she maintains a lot of patience, which I kind of feel like I could learn from. <laughs> um, but yeah, so those are my two main professional mentors. And then, of course, my mom and my dad. Miigwech. So on the other side of the table, we're going to ask, what advice would you give to someone seeking mentorship in their community? Well, hold on, I'm only 25. How did I get on this other side? <laughs> we put you in the middle. She put you in the middle. Great. You're in the middle. I just turned it in January. Man, you turn 25 and they just throw you out there and make you be a mentor. Old soul, girl. Old soul. <laughs> Holy. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, man, this is the first time anybody's after, actually asked me. Um, how to be a, a good mentor. I've always been the, the young and one. And I'm still young, by the way. Um, <laughs> but really, growing up, I've always had um, strong women around me who've helped raise me. And so it's Jackie as well. Um, National Walking Day, I was the only person that showed up. So I got to eat all the bananas. So it was really nice. <laughs> and then Dawn, she's been there. They've always just had these duh moments, just like um, Indigenous women have always been strong. Like, duh, you've always been strong. Well, you know what to do. That's, oh, they always say that. You know what to do. Like, I won't be asking you if I didn't know what to do. What to do. <laughs> but in reality, um, they teach you who you are, and they teach you your foundations. They teach you your language and your culture. And from there, they let that guide you to figure out what is your passion and, and where do you want to go with that. So I always try to bring that out. And, and help folks um, understand those. And so now I know this much language. Now it's my job to teach that. And so I know this much teachings. It's my job to teach that now because next thing you know, you're going to be on this other side of this table and people are going to be making you be the mentor and be the leader. And um, <laughs> it, it happens very quickly. You're all, and so whatever lessons that you have, take it from everybody. If it's not um, a certain type of mentorship, like one-on-one, -on -one, you're always going to be talking to them once a month. What if you just meet one really strong woman that you want to learn something from? That's, that's like a really one-time thing, but take that lesson and, and put it in your backpack or your purse or whatever type of thing that you have to hold stuff, your pocket, I don't know, your purse, <laughs> and you just take it and you figure out, okay, well, what did I learn from this? And how can I go forward? And so one big thing that we did for our tribe is uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Terry Peterson, she came. She did a lot of research around mentorship. What does that look like for um, the, the younger generation? What does that look like for the middle generation? And what does that look like 
um, for the older generation. What does this mentorship look like? And then she taught us that there's all these different types of models. There's the one-on-one -on -one mentorship. There's putting people into your shoes type of mentorship. So one thing that we did at the school um, was a little scary. It's called director for the day. And so once a month, I choose one of our staff and then we switch roles. And so this coming month, our expectant family specialist, she helps all of the, the families who are expecting babies to come. She's going to be the director and I'm going to switch with her. <sighs> and so it's me gaining experience as well. So it's not just someone learning how to be the director and be the leader. We're switching and we're both gaining experience and we're both taking something home so that we make our jobs better. And you know, one day she could be the director and she could make that school and we could be all the way to, our, to a different school that we'll be working on. We just need to help grow each other and work with them is my biggest takeaway is what mentorship is. It's you learn from not just the ones who are older, you learn from those young ones. So my students who are in high school, some of them are sitting over there. They've taught me so many different lessons. Our horses that we work with, they've taught me so many different lessons. A mentor can be literally everything. And so I like to do that as my big message and I'm done. Well, I um, try to be like the women who mentored me. And um, uh, my grandmother, um, her name was Effie Day. And she didn't speak um, English very much. And, um, but I would go and uh, stay with her in the summer. And she listened. You know, she listened. And, um, and she was never judgmental. She was always um, really kind and caring. So I think about my grandmother, and I also think about um, um, uh, uh, Lillian Rice, who, and when my mother died when I was 36, and immediately uh, Lillian began calling me Indonis, and that's how she treated me. And she taught me um, things like, I remember once we were gonna build a sweat lodge, and she said, well, we have to get these poles uh, first thing in the morning. So I said, okay, what time? She said, five o'clock. And so it was still dark out. <clears throat> and we were, <clears throat> excuse me, getting ready to go cut these poles for the sweat lodge. About five years later, she called me up and she said, we need to build one out in um, a lodge out in Stillwater. And so I said to her, oh, okay, so like what time do we have to meet to get out there? And she said, oh, uh, pick me up at nine. <laughs> <laughs> But um, you have to learn it the exactly the right way the first time. And I think about um, Muriel Miguel, who um, Spider Woman Theater. Um, um, she was uh, she taught me about um, acting and directing, and um, but she was also there for me. So as a as a two spirit woman, as a lesbian, I didn't have many mentors. Um, but uh, the first time I met Muriel, she was down the street from here. <clears throat> there used to be a theater called um, At the Foot of the Mountain Theater, and uh, they were performing a play called that they developed here called um, Exotic, Neurotic, something else. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so anyhow, the, um, the second time I met Muriel, she came up to me after the show, and she said, so are you two partners? And this was like 1985. <laughs> And um, I couldn't believe that somebody would just ask me that. Uh, and, uh, but she taught me how to be um, uh, brave. And, um, and uh, some years later, uh, we were in Nova Scotia at a two-spirit gathering. And there was something that um, was bothering me. And I thought, you know, I've gone through like all of this counseling and everything and I, I'm a pretty healthy person. And, um, but then my, my partner at the time said, you know, there's this thing that I think you need to deal with. And so um, it was Muriel and Janet Spotted Eagle and uh, some of those um, women who were older than me. I went to them and I eat, gave them each tobacco and I asked them to help me. And, you know, I didn't, you know, like when we're younger, we, we don't really think about, um, like we think about our own needs, right? And so to get in that sweat lodge, you have to you have to get on your hands and knees and enter it that way. And 
um, they each did that. But then we had to have these little wooden stools for them to sit on because you know they 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 were older and they couldn't sit on the ground. And um, I'll never um, forget that because uh, that was where probably had to do everything else first. But that was where real healing took place. And then lastly, uh, Josephine Mendamin. Uh, Josephine was the grandmother who began the water walks, and um, she taught me everything. And uh, she was, um, you know, as I led walks and I would have questions and, um, and I would question my own judgment, she always picked up the phone. Or if I said, um, you know, we're walking in a, in a blizzard and could you petition um, uh, Kiwade and Noden to be gentle with us? She'd say, I'll do that right now. And the next day, the wind was at our back. She was always there. Uh, she was the Ogima Ogichida Ikwe Medewanakwe. Miigwech. I'm going to open this one up to everybody. <laughs> if you could talk to your younger self 10 years ago, what would you tell them? I was 11. <laughs> I was 11? <laughs> um, when, okay, so when I was 11, I was like, I was, I was struggling. I was going through a lot of issues, like self-confidence issues um, and a lot of hurt. And at that time, like, I was so lost. Like, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't, like, look into my future. I didn't have, like, goals in the future. I didn't want to be, like, I wasn't like, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to get this big degree and I'm going to do all these amazing things. I didn't even think of that. I just wanted to get through the next day. I wanted to go to sleep and that was it. So, um, yeah, that was a really tough time for me. And I would tell myself that, like, you need to believe in yourself and you need to understand that you're continuously growing. Like, you never, ever stop growing as a person. And... It's important to know that you impact others and it's important to know that others impact you. Um, but the most important thing I would tell myself is to believe in yourself and to believe that you have the power to do whatever you want, whenever you want to do it. And the only thing standing in your way is you. That's what I would tell myself. Um, so I was seven. Um, <laughs> if my if my seven year old self grew up, there's no way in the world I would be up here doing this. I wouldn't even talk to the person sitting next to me. I would. It took me three speech classes to get to where I am today. So I would probably tell that person to just work on speaking to people. You don't always have to be so nervous and shy. <laughs> Um, so I was 15, I was in ninth grade. <laughs> like a of it. Um, I was in ninth grade, I was a freshman. Um, I would tell myself to chill out. Holy smokes, girl. I try to take over the whole world by that age. Um, I was the president of the, the grade and then I was working my way up for my campaign so I could be president of student body by the time I was in 12th grade. And then... <laughs> I don't know who I was. I was a basketball. I was like literally in every single thing. And I tried to be the captain of it all. And I was like, okay. They're like, oh no, seniors are captain. I said, wait, what? <laughs> and I was like, but. And then I started working at banquets. I was on one, people. I don't know. <laughs> I worked at banquets and I was working there for like um, two years by then, I think. And then my coworker, who's now my co-teacher, Ryan, I think he's watching, hey. Um, he got manager position because he's older. He's like, he was like 25 or maybe he was older. I don't know. He is older. But um, I was like, the only reason why you got that position is because I'm not 18 yet. Like, I was crazy, people. <laughs> like, I just needed to chill. That's what my biggest takeaway would be. But then again, I feel like if I was, if I wasn't, if I was more chill than I was then, I wouldn't be where I am because I was like, go, go, go. Um, my parents always told me, like, my my education, that's where you're going to prosper. My mom was the first to graduate in high school, and then I became the first to graduate with a, a bachelor's degree. And so I always tell that story because, not for claps, but because it's not 
rare. It's not a rare thing in, in Native communities. And so she was like, you need to get education. You need to graduate. You need to keep going. Eighth grade, I told her I had my first boyfriend. And then she said I couldn't have him because I didn't figure out what I wanted to do with my life. She was on one too. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I was just, I was always working, working, working. But I would say maybe calm down a little bit learn how to cook better. I can't cook for anything right now. You know, learn about the happier things in life. That's what I would do. Slash, if I didn't work so hard, I wouldn't be here at such a young age. So I don't know. And then ninth grade, I was like crazy into education. And sometimes that education world takes you. And sometimes it belittles who we are as an indigenous people. So I always, I wrote this paper and I, oh, I hate this paper now. It was a 10 page paper. I was so proud of it. And it's called, um, my mom, she's from Arizona. It's like how she rose to social classes because I was working about social classes. It's going to be sociology because Barack Obama took sociology. And then um, <laughs> that's what I was going to do because I was going to be president of the United States as well. And then um, I wrote this paper and it was like how she rose to social classes. And it was called um, my mom's name rising from the dust because Arizona is dusty. It was pretty, uh, <laughs> but it really belittled her. It made her, it made it seem like she was poor and it made her, but really she's like the Navajo nation. They have their culture. They have their language. She's a first language speaker, but I always thought of her as, oh, she doesn't really know English well. That's silly, Vernie. Like she can't say that well, but I belittled her because that education system kind of took me a little bit. So I would have, I would tell myself to understand the strengths of both. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay. We're gonna flip again. It's a similar question. Where do you see yourself ten years from now? And your passions. I hope I'm still alive. <laughs> Anyone can start. <laughs> That's funny. Um, how I see myself ten years from now? I hope to have all my degrees. Um, I want to get uh, a major, I'm a major in Native American studies and with an emphasis on language because I want to bring an immersion school to my res. And um, another mentor of mine, no, <laughs> um, she, she was a really uh, amazing teacher. She really, um, she really listened to me and she always guided me in school. And my ancestors knew that. And she, um, she, she lives off the reservation actually. And she, that's one day I have her in chemistry. She's like, Lexis, I had a dream and I'm guessing a dream means a vision. I don't know. And I was like, I was like, sure. Okay. And she's like, I had a dream that you went to law school and you came back and you like killed it on the res. And I was like, okay, I'll just pick up law school. So I did. So I was like, okay, well, minor in law as well. So like, hopefully I have those degrees in 10 years and I'm back home and I'm creating that immersion school and I'm making life better on the Turtle Mountain Reds. That's my goal. <laughs> um, so in 10 years, kind of same, I hope to have my degree, so my bachelor and my MD. Um, hopefully that'll be sped up with my PSEO credits as well. Um, so in 10 years, I'll probably be in a residency program of some sort, working towards my goal still. Oh, man. Like surgery or what? <laughs> like Grey's Anatomy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just watch that. Man, I'm so I'm excited. Um, ten years, I'll be 35. So I'm hoping uh, we have a birth to five year old school. I hope we open another building so we get more classrooms. We're seeing a huge need for it. Um, we don't. We have such a big waiting list already. Um, we filled up way quicker than we thought. And so I hope we keep using our data so we can keep expanding. And then I hope we even build a K through two. And, you know, our, our whole staff, we keep growing together and we're growing um, teachers who know their language and teachers who know the culture. And then I hope we are growing leaders as well. And so that's my biggest hope and, and fear as well. So then I can grow someone who can then take my spot. And so then if there's something else our tribe needs, then I can move on and, and help that team. And so that's, I don't know, maybe I'll get my, maybe I'll be a doctor, Dr. Good Thunder. Ooh, that sounds good. <laughs> um, or I don't know, maybe I'll go out for politics. I see Chief Executive Melanie Benjamin up there. Gosh, she just gives me so much fire. I don't know. That's, I'll see where life takes me. Hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I'm 67, so um, <clears throat> I do hope to be alive at 77. Um, I hope to be uh, um, walking uh, uh, the rivers, um, um, singing songs, um, and uh, uh, my musical theater piece. Um, let's say that'll be on Broadway. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. I, I just hope to be really enjoying um, enjoying life and um, um, maybe I'll have great grandchildren by then, I don't know. But yeah, that's it. Miigwech, thank you for sharing about the rivers. I'm a river woman, so I too, I have an old soul, so maybe me and Vanessa, we're the same age, but we're a little. <laughs> so I'm like, man. <laughs> If I didn't have to work so many jobs, I would just be walking rivers and lakes every single day. I'd probably be running them, but then as I get older, I'd be walking them. So thank you for sharing that. I've got one fun one, okay? So we'll, we'll stop with the, the past and present. What's something that someone can't tell about you just by looking at you? Or maybe, wait. What's something that someone couldn't tell about you just by looking at you? I don't know. I feel like you could just tell everything right here. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can't tell about me. Um, would you, huh? Oh, yeah, I make videos. <laughs> I, uh, I do, I started a vlog. I have one video up. So um, <laughs> I have like three months worth of footage and I like never edited it because it takes like six hours. Um, but yeah, I do. I actually love making videos and like um, storytelling and all that. Maybe you could tell because I like talking. I don't know. But um, yeah, that's like a fun part about me. I, I like to make videos and that's why I met Missy and like that's why we're all close because she taught me how to like tell stories in like in, in how I see it because like um, when I first started making videos, I started with PBS NewsHour and of course uh, like they were non-native so they're like just tell the truth and I was like you want like the whole truth <laughs> like all of it like are you sure and because like they came to our like school on the res and they're like yeah just tell the truth sometimes the media feels like they only like tell part of it and I was like yeah <laughs> so that's why yeah so that's why I feel like that's why I take that and I'm going to run with it because, of course, we all feel like the media only tells, like, parts of the truth. So let's take the media and let's tell the truth and let's tell how we see the world, right? Yeah. Amen. I will see you. <laughs> so that's why, I like make, that's why I like making videos because I want to tell our side of the story. And that's why I want to do vlogs so people see how I see the world and how we see the world and how we interpret things. End it. Let's end it. Um, a lot of people don't know that I'm really into art. Um, I just think it's really important for me to take it out as like a stress reliever. Um, I don't even have an art class this year, but my art teacher knows that art is really important to me. So she's like, hey, come in whenever, like you can do whatever. And so that's really important to me that I can just go to her and she can help me do whatever I want, basically, and not even have her as a teacher. Um, another thing is... Um, people tend to think I'm older. Maybe it's because I'm so tall, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's maybe another one. Yeah. She was like, I'm 17. I was sitting here thinking like, she's, she's like 22. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, uh, people don't know about me. My favorite thing to do at the school is, um, go see the kids and I go post give my yuza, which means give me a hug. And they all run and give me a hug. <laughs> the youngest one who understands that is about 10 months old so that's i know it's just this little they're just like and then sometimes they like come at you and they go they waddle, they waddle. i'm like all i need is for you to understand it and sometimes they go post get my user and they go no i'm like okay well at least you understood it so jokes on you <laughs> so that's my favorite thing um is just hearing the language and and people don't know that I like really hate to say I, I like to say we, um, because our whole mission of the school is to raise the next generation of Dakota language speakers. 
And so I'm not actually doing that every single day. I'm not with those children. I'm not speaking the language with them. It's those teachers who do it. And so it really has to be a we effort. And that's always something I always like to tell people that. And then I have a YouTube channel for my puppy. He's Pomeranian. He's like this big. All of his commands, this, this is, it's going to be educational people. Like this is a good thing. Uh, all of his commands are in Dakota. So he knows, post give my use. Um, he knows um, ima putaka, so give me a kiss. Uh, Itaka and all of that stuff. Check it out. It's called Bentley Kachi with Bentley. <laughs> <laughs> Dakota language. It's educational. Yeah, I, I, um, I think, um, I guess I, there's really nothing I don't think that um, um, oh, um, I guess I prefer um, teenagers over adults any day. Um, I, I really don't have any other, anything to say about this. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right, I've got one more, I think, before we open it up to the audience. Um, so this is a question for Vanessa. Is it true that the previous governor, Mark Dayton, declared a Vanessa Good Thunder Day in your honor? And what day is this? Can you tell us about this? It's true. I think it's I the day that. after Pearl Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> it's December 8th. December 8th? Yeah. And can you say how, how this happened? Um, well, I worked for him um, and then Lieutenant Governor Tina Smith. Um, she's now Senator. And then um, chief, the Chief of Staff was uh, Jamie Tincher. So she saw me um, and heard me speak for five minutes. And then from there, she offered me that job of um, aide to the Chief of Staff. And then um, from there, it grew to Tribal um, Policy Advisor. So I worked there and then I, I had to leave them because I went to go home um, to my people to, to grow this school. And so from there, he, he made that day. Good. Thank you. Uh, well, there's actually two of us sitting up here then who have had a day um, mm -hmm. named after Tell us. us um, uh, November 10th, uh, 1998 is uh, Sharon M. Day Day. Sharon M. Can you My tell governor. us the story? Sorry, can you can you share your story with us? How did you get um, your day? Yeah, I was awarded um, <clears throat> the Gazella Kanapka Award for working with um, a youth um, on that day. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, quit. Nice. Okay. You won a round of applause too. <laughs> that was before they were born. <laughs> November tenth. November tenth. So it's before Veterans Day. We quit. Okay, question. Um, I'm gonna open them up now for the audience questions. We have some ladies in the front who are gonna. Yeah, so thank you everybody. I know some of you have text questions into the number listed here on the slide. Um, we're gonna have some staff running around and picking up note cards if you prefer to submit a question that way and then we're gonna read it out to the panelists. So we actually do have a number of questions that have been texted in. So. Um, We'll go ahead and start with this first one. Uh, in your own perspective, what do you think makes a good leader? You just want to go down. Um, I think what makes a good leader is a good listener. Um, you, sometimes you don't have to say anything. Sometimes even just a hug or you know something like that. Just ears, someone to listen to for for like someone like me to vent and. Something I could, someone I can trust to talk to is, um, I feel, is a good leader, but also a person who lives a good life, a person who leads by example, um, does positive things, and doesn't bring other people down. Um, yeah, I agree with the good listener part, but I also I would also say that the leader um, has to be humble. I like when leaders just do stuff for like the greater good and not to make themselves look better. I would say a fierce mind, a brave soul, and a kind spirit. And just like Jaden said, someone who works with and for the people and not for themselves. Yeah, I think somebody who follows, uh, you know, among the Ojibwe, we have the seven 
uh, grandfather teachings, and I think somebody who follows those teachings, um, you have to follow those teachings to be a good leader. And but what Vanessa was saying, you know, long ago, um, there was a woman who said to me, um, you're, you're a good leader as long as you have the best interests of your people in mind. Once um, your own interests become more important, uh, then the people will take care of you and uh, you'll no longer be a leader. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how can you create positive change in your community? I get faced with this all the time, actually. Uh, being on youth council, like we have a whole like strategic plan on how we feel we could make our community better. And um, sometimes we get hit with like those roadblocks, those roadblocks where um, sometimes you yeah, have people are just like, the council is only there to take the money and uh, no one cares about us. And if I wanted 10 bucks and came in here, I wouldn't get the 10 bucks because it's not my cousin. And, you know, we get all that all the time. <laughs> and like sometimes, yeah. And sometimes we sit there like, I don't, I don't know what to, what to help you, like how to help you. Like, I don't know how to change that. So like, Sometimes we get faced with that and like we just have to and at the end of the day, we just have to be positive ourselves. Like, you know what I mean? Like we have to and in order to have positive change, like you need to be positive. And like when you come to those uh, those negative um, mindsets, um, you got to like persevere and like push through those things. And you just um, say that I understand where your hurt is coming from, but we need to solve this in a positive way instead of like in anger and. Um, with arguing and yelling. And so in order to do positive change in a community, you have to be positive, of course. And um, you have to have like your whole community like together uh, and buy-in and saying that we want change and we want positive change and we're going to do this. Like you just need that energy, I believe. Um, yeah, I would say just getting everybody involved. I know for our unity group, some of them are sitting over there, but um, we work as a group and we do stuff for the community and fundraisers. And I think that's a really important thing is just get the youth involved because um, as teenagers, we kind of have a stereotype that we don't care. Um, but for a lot of teenagers, it's very different. Um, I would say engagement in all of the, the generations, um, even the little Akayaja, the little ones. And... Um, work with everybody. And so when you're working with everybody, you have to listen to everybody. It takes a lot of um, intentionality and it takes a lot of patience. And then um, also understand that when you're trying to make this positive change, there's gonna be hardships. There's gonna be some things that don't go right. Instead of just squashing it and trying to create something, a whole new spark, you know, try to fix what's happening there and try to grow from it and be stronger. Um, I think we are so quick to try to squash things when really we don't see the potential to keep going. Um, yeah. I think, um, you know, there it's it's always good to have, to know like what the big picture is. And so um, right now in Minnesota, um, we're engaged in um, looking at our uh, Minnesota uh, tribal constitution, Minnesota Chippewa tribe. And um, and so encouraging people to um, become educated. And so I've been working with a group called Zagi Pagong for about three years. And um, we've done, uh, we knew that we had to educate the community. So um, we have um, a website, we have videos, we have um, Facebook live sessions, and just really trying to educate the people because you know, how many of you know what's in your tribal constitution? So educating people about um, what's in there and, um, and, and what's not in there. So in our current constitution, there's nothing about the environment. And, uh, but we could look to other countries um, like um, Bolivia and uh, New Zealand and some of those countries and, and even uh, India, once it gained its independence, um, it, it put in, in their constitution protections for the land. And so um, what I uh, am suggesting to people that in our preamble that we talk about those seven grandfather teachings and that if we're going to live in peace and, um, and uh, be kind and uh, be generous, it's not only with 
our own tribal members, but um, but with um, the land and the resources that that sustain us, um, and that that's missing from our constitution right now. So um, I think just really educating people and um, listening. Um, so when people say, "Well, we can't do this because of this," we can't do this because the federal government has to approve it. Um, you know, then well, we thought that. Um, uh, whoever thought that the Berlin Wall would come down, some of you probably don't even know what that is. Um, <laughs> uh, that there would, the collapse of the um, of Russia, you know, like who's to say that the way things are, are the way things have to stay? And, um, you know, where are the countries in the world where the colonizers are still in control of the land and the and the resources and the governance? You know, where are those countries? United States, Canada, Australia, and uh, New Zealand. Those four countries that, that were the last ones to vote for uh, indigenous rights at, at the UN. So, you know, giving people sort of that bigger picture and, uh, and aspire to, to change, um, uh, aspire, inspire people to, to take up um, whatever work it is that you do, to do it the best possible way you can. All right, thank you. Um, the next question is, what challenges and what challenges you and motivates you when you are striving for a goal? Um, what challenges me and inspires me? Um, I feel like this is such like a weird thing for me because growing like when I started thinking about school and stuff, like I always felt like I knew what I wanted to do. Like I was never like, oh, I want to do this or maybe I want to do this. Like I always wanted to like be in history and I always like had a spark in me for like my culture and who I was like every time I thought about it like I just felt like this is who I am and I'm so proud of who I am and it made me feel good it made me feel empowered so like I always had that inside me like I always knew what I wanted to do so that's why like people ask me like I would I feel like I was put on this earth to do what I'm doing right now and to do like what I hope I end up achieving so like um that's I I'm always pushing myself like I'm always feeling like okay I need to do this to do this and do this to do this um what inspires me is what my people and um how amazing they are people are I always um sometimes it kind of hurts me because like on the res like some people are just like I hate it here and this place is horrible and you never grow here and I hate it Ugh, I need to leave and like I just I love it I love my reservation I love my people even though like we're going through it like we're growing and we're beautiful and we have beautiful stories and it's so inspiring and that's what inspires me is because at the end of the day I just want to help them and I just want my people to know who they are and be proud of who they are um and that's what I feel like I gotta do so I'm gonna I'm do it and I'm gonna work every day because because I'm gonna do it <laughs> Um, I would say my biggest motivation is to know that I have a goal that I'm trying to achieve. Um, I was always like that 10th grader when I, or that 10 year old whenever you would ask them what they want to be and it's like a doctor. Like that was always me and I always knew what I wanted to do. So um, I know that it's all going to pay off in the end. And I would say another motivation is when people say no. <laughs> um, I'm kind of a stubborn person. So when people say that I can't do something, I'm going to go do it. Um, so that's my motivation is trying to just be the best I can and achieve my goal. Um, I would say your people who, who do, who are the people who you have around you, who's your team? Um, because you always, always vibe off each other. It's a vibe. Um, so like Trella, Nevea, we're all hanging out one day and they're like, New Year's, what are you guys doing? They're like, I don't know. Like, it seems like everybody is out drinking. They're like, we need to do like a lock-in. Yeah, let's stay in. Let's lock ourselves in. Let's not fall asleep. And I was like, oh my God, like, I don't know why I was vibing with it. I was like, let's do it. And so then we did it and oh, it was exhausting, but we did it. And then we decided to keep keep on doing it to the other four uh, Dakota tribes. And it just happened. Um, the money came later. We always, we don't really think about the money. Oh, we can always get some money. And then 
um, we I was at the uh, governor's residence and we had all of 11 tribes, um, well, most of the 11 tribes there, and we were just vibing and some, uh, uh, it was um, Farron Jackson, the president of Leech Lake, chairman of Leech Lake, and he was like, oh yeah, Billy Mills. The governor was like, who's Billy Mills? And we all dropped our forks. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> um, and then they were like telling all these stories. They're like, yeah, you know, he was there during like, um, Nazi Germany and I was like um it was in Tokyo but <laughs> I didn't want to say anything I just let it happen and then um I was like yeah I was like he was at that um, White House tribal youth gathering he was amazing and then he was like what is that and then chief executive Melanie Benjamin she spoke about it she said it and then she was like we should have a Minnesota tribal youth gathering and I was like that's a vibe yes <laughs> I was like, that's what we need. And so follow up. Um, so the people who are around you who vibe together and we we have a think tank, really, we're just like going off and we're just you have to have comfortability with it. You have to have bravery, I think, to even express yourselves and, and put these big ideas out. And so that's all I needed to hear was her to say it. And like the next week I had this whole portfolio. I was like, this is what she said, because he was like, yeah, it's a good idea. We should do it. And I put in red. You said you would do it. And then. <laughs> And that's not actually how you make briefs for him, but I was new, so I got to use that. Um, he, and he was like, oh, yeah, we should do it. And he's like, how do you think we're going to do it? I'm like, it's going to be so easy. We just have to do it. And it's so not easy, actually. Um, I was like, but it's going to be good. And then he's like, oh, where's money? is?" I was like, it'll come later. And he's like, okay, well, you can do it if you can find the money. And I'm like, got it. It's a vibe. Like, let's do it. Um, so always have the people around you who like inspire you, who, who work for the same things and then just vibe with them and have these fun think tanks. Cause you never know what's going to happen from that. Like just sh uh, having fun. <laughs> um, what inspires me is, um, is, uh, my clan. I'm Wabi Sheshi and our job is to take care of the people. And so, um, I have 13 brothers and sisters, and uh, there's not a millionaire among us um, because we were raised to take care of the people. And so, you know, we're teachers um, on the tribal council where um, my sister teaches many women how to be midwives. Um, you know, that's, that's how we grew up, to take care of the people. Your first job to take care of your family, your your clan, your band, the tribe, and then ultimately all of humanity. And so if you know what your clan is, um, then you know what your job is. Um, my name inspires me, uh, Nagma Maingan, Singing Wolf. Um, I try to be like those wolves, right? To They live in a, in a society, um, they, they, you, do you know that when a male, when a wolf is born in a pack, when a cub is born, the males have a, there's some gland that secretes a hormone where they all want to take care of that cub. So I try to be like, um, you know, live up to my name, um, live up to my clan. And then uh, the young people, um, uh, you know, for the 29 years I've been at the task force, I've never stopped um, working with the youth. And even though I'm the executive director, I still travel with them. In fact, Sunday they're going up to uh, Fond du Lac to do a performance, um, uh, a play that I wrote called We Are the Water. They're going to do it for um, at the aquarium for um, the water exhibit there. And I love that. I love being around them because you know, they challenge you, they, you know, just listening to these young people, you know, makes you think um, about things and, and, um, and love, you know, we, we protect that which we love. And so, um, you know, for me, that's uh, um, the young people and, um, and our waterways, you know, the arteries of our Nimama Ki. Glitch, I think we have time for one more question. Thank you, Thank you so much um, for your responses. They're really great. Um, I apologize. We are doing our best to get to as many questions as possible. So I know we're not able to um, ask all of them. So uh, for the last question, we'll close out with 
what would you like to see from the next generation of women, particularly indigenous women? So like us? Or like the our next, next Yeah, like what are your, our like, yeah, like what do you oh, hope for in terms of the future of indigenous women? I want to see them believing in themselves. I want to see them loving each other. I want to see them doing what they want, when they want, and looking good while they do it. <laughs> you know, and just loving each other. And because we have a big role. I, I, I don't know who said this, but they said um, the men have to protect. Um, the rest of the job is up to the women. We have to do everything else. We got to. We got to love, we got to care for, we got to be there for, we got to guide, we got to feed, we got to give life. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's what I want to see. I want to see our women doing what they want and going for it. Not thinking that, oh, I'm not going to do it because I'm not going to get paid as much as this dude. I'm going to do it because I want to do it. And you're going to be a leader and you're going to inspire, and you're going to lead, and you're going to follow. Um, yeah, just do what you want and believe in yourself because you could. Women are so powerful. Like when we were just talking earlier, the lady in my my row over there, she said it was like we got here, like we were like the first people here, and it was like no one except us. And then everyone rolled in, and you just felt that energy, that powerfulness, that spirit. Like you're part of that spirit. Like that's inside you. Mm. Native or not, you know what I mean? You're powerful. Believe that. Um, I would like to see Indigenous women spread out into more uh, occupational fields, especially the health field. Um, there's a big minority discrepancy in the health field, um, let alone Indigenous people in the health field. So, um, I'd like to see... Um, us doing what we always do, washag unkichiapi. We're always making ourselves stronger, and so whatever that looks like. So, like I always think about 1978. That's when American Indian Religious Freedom Act happened, and we got our first um, Sundance and our first Anipi back on the Lower Sioux. And so, by the time I was born in 1994, I had the privilege to never have to know what it was like to be without it. And so, then my hope and, and my dream is by the time. Um, the next generation where they're all being born now is they won't have to know what it's like to be without the language and they just keep on we just keep on ticking it back and we just keep on bringing back who we are so whatever that looks like for for them um, they get to have the tools and the resources to keep on growing our people yeah I, I um, I'm very hopeful that the next generation will um, uh, you know, every generation we we expect to be better than the last, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and and I think that um, you know, if we if we can um, really, uh, well, I'll just say this: when um, I was with the uh, theater group and. Um, Carlisle last fall for this. Um, um, it was the first um, uh, boarding school conference, and they performed their uh, play called um, "Everything Is a Circle." It talks about sexual violence um, to our children and historical trauma, and but it also talks about healing. And uh, there was a man; his, name, his last name was Sam. He was from Alaska, and when they got done, he said to them. We try to throw every generation farther ahead. And he said to them, um, I have a son and I have two grandchildren. And it would be uh, such an honor for you, uh, he's saying that to these young people, to raise my grandchildren. And I thought that um, was such a tribute to them. And if we um, can move our communities together, not leaving anybody behind, you know, bringing everybody uh, forward. And, um, you know, we, we will not have health restored in our community until we provide services uh, to those um, who are the most alienated. 
and I'm talking about like our homeless people, you know, that are over at the navigation center just on the other side, you know, not very far from here. When we open our doors to all of our all of our people um, and make sure that they all have adequate services and hope, you know, we have to have hope and we have to have jobs. And um, so I'm hoping that this next generation will really, um, you know, we have survived this long because we are communal societies, because we are, um, we depend upon each other. And uh, we can never be like that individualistic that we only think about ourselves. You know, um, Representative Susan Allen, or former uh, Representative Susan Allen, she's always said, you know, my job is to, is to bring, raise up my family with me and everybody in the community around me. And I think that, if we can do, this next generation can help to do that, uh, we'll be uh, farther ahead um, than, uh, than we are now. Although we've made great strides in the last, uh, in my lifetime. Good, can we give our panelists a round of applause? I really don't like podiums because I'm short. <laughs> um, thank you to our panel again. And next we have an, a video address from Deb Halan. I think they're gonna get it up here for you guys. She cannot be here. Oh, thank you, Meredith. Um, she cannot be here in person, but she did want to partake in our event here. So she sent us a video that we are gonna play for you guys. And for those of you who don't know, she is the congressional representative from New Mexico, and she is uh, Pueblo of Laguna. Right 
You guys can talk amongst yourselves. We have a little technical difficulty here, but it's coming up. Don't talk too much. No. So if you could just hang on one minute, we're going to have the video by, by uh, Congressional Representative Deb Holland. Uh, the reason we are doing this a little earlier than it, what it says on the program, um, you need me to talk louder? Don't hold it, sorry, okay. The video will be coming and then we will take our break uh, because one of our guests in the next panel will be visiting us via Skype. And so we wanted to do the video now so we, so we don't have um, to work through technology at that point. I think I'm too close to the mic. And so, Hello, here she comes. I'm Congresswoman Deb Holland, and I. Could you? Because you're gonna get the. He's gonna get the big, the audio. Hello, everybody. I'm Congresswoman Deb Holland, and I serve New Mexico's first congressional district. I'm honored to have the opportunity to share a few words with you all as you participate in this International Women's Day Symposium. With a historic number of women serving in Congress and even in local legislatures and state government, we're seeing women running for office and winning. International Women's Day takes on a much more significance this year. It's inspiring. During this symposium, you are hearing from so many talented, experienced, and accomplished Native women who are breaking down barriers and giving a voice to an entire group of people who have never been represented by someone who looks like them. We are the embodiment of the dreams and perseverance of mothers and grandmothers. That's why I'm working on being a voice for the silent crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women, and also working to ensure that the federal government lives up to its trust obligations. Women are leaders and naturally collaborate and find solutions and have historically made immense contributions to this country. It is my hope that we learn from each other and build a society where anyone has access to opportunity and where everyone has a seat at the table when advocating for our communities. Best wishes as you continue your symposium. Thank you. Thank you. And now we are going to take a 15 minute break before we come back for our next panel. Do the remarks one? Um, I'm gonna do this just so everybody. Okay. Oh, because um, uh, this is on. Oh, right. Um, oh yeah, you're right. So we'll take it down.
Okay. Oh, sure. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, you couldn't hear that in there? Oh, okay. Okay. You can hear it all. No video? Uh, I can turn it up for you for that. I mean, we can, I'll, I'll go in there and I'll, there's a little adjustment in there I can do. I'm just waiting for her to reply and say, say that she's ready. So.
Okay. So she sent Okay, so she came in yesterday. She sent me an email Wednesday at six o'clock saying she wasn't gonna come. Because she has to be back tomorrow for a televised debate. She's running for mayor of Salem. Um, 